Javier for joining us today. So the working title for our interview today is Transdisciplinary Study and Sensing as Unmaking. And so, uh, Elvira, I was wondering if we could uh, briefly start in sort of you um, provide clarifying for our audience what aesthetics are, and then provide us with a brief example of how you're using it as a participatory strategy uh, among diverse publics. Okay, well, thanks for having me and thanks for your questions. So um, the term aesthetics has uh, multiple meanings, of course. Uh, for example, it's often used in the philosophy of art um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a term to describe taste or beauty, talk about taste or beauty. Um, I use the term as a form of artistic expression. So aesthetics defines for me, the language of form uh, or languages of artistic expression. So uh, in that sense, aesthetics describes the ways we experience art or uh, experience art making or any form of artistic expression that uh, is connected to Mm, the bodily senses, seeing, listening, uh, tasting, touching, smelling. And so aesthetics, how I use the term, typically considers not so much questions of beauty, but of experience of art. As well as, as other things, like not just experience of art, but experiencing the world as a, okay. uh, so but in the sense in in, in with regard to art uh, as a means of knowing but knowing and experiencing the world right okay through all our bodily senses and that would make sense why we sort of each would transform or or, or communicate or transfer our experiences differently that ultimately reflects why we have different voices as creatives, right? Right. So we're talking about aesthetic transformation processes, right? And um, aesthetics is here used in the sense that it's not uh, a process that is based on language. Um, and my, I might have to explain what, what I understand with an aesthetic transformation process. Um, so in an aesthetic transformation process, uh, participants uh, pass on ideas or concepts to each other um, with the means of aesthetics, which means not necessarily just through language by, you know, telling you something uh, and you pass it on, but maybe this can be a, a drawing, it can be an image, it can be sound, um, anything that um, addresses aesthetics, which means the mm. visual, the audible, the body, bodily sensible with regard to meaning making. Mm. So do, uh, now the brief bio said you are doing aesthetic transformation with physicists. So who started off those communications? Did the artists provide physicists with something first or did the physicists provide artists with something first? Um, I had the opportunity to work with physicists uh, in a, in an in the context of an art uh, exhibition that was curated by Sunny Care at the Agnes Etherington Center. The art project is called Drift Art and Dark Matter, where artists were invited uh, to work with physicists at Snow Lab um, around the dark matter research. And so those four artists would um, create works in response to that uh, topic, science topic, if you like. Mm -hmm. And so the start of uh, my, my experiments that I was uh, proposing as a sort of supporting program uh, for the Agnes was then that the, um, the artworks were um, available 
uh, made available for the physicists, invited physicists, like six of them from the University of Toronto as from Queens, um, where, where the physicists would then respond to artworks as the prompts mm. in an aesthetic transformation process. Hmm. Interesting. I can uh, explain this a little bit more in detail and also show you maybe um, a, a visual if you like. Sure. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. So, so the, the, this aesthetic transformation experiment that I had the opportunity to under, undertake would uh, ask physicists to respond to artworks of the mentioned exhibition, the Drift and Dark Matter um exhibition mm -hmm. and here's an example by arthur b mcdonald who is a nobel prize uh, award awardee for um particle physics um he was also part of the experiment which was very interesting um along with um five other Physicists, uh, René Losek, uh, Miriam Diamond, Joe Bramante, Tony Noble, and Erika Caden uh, from the Snow Lab. And uh, I asked the physicists to respond to a chosen artwork, uh, artwork of their choice, uh, with an unfiltered response, like uh, to draw a sketch in one minute, something that stood out for them. Uh, in the artwork and uh, and just note it down in a quick sketch. And that sketch was then um, further used to um, think about um, how, uh, how it can be applied to a physics topic that they are working on in terms of dark matter. Um, I had an alternative process where we were just working with terms and words, associations. So it's definitely an induced association process that took place, expressed uh, once through drawing and uh, once through just terms and language. Mm. Then the physicists were asked to just frame, uh, let's say, uh, a burning question in their research in their research or in, in terms of dark matter in a few sentences. And they would do that too. They had like 10 minutes or so. So it was all kind of limited time frames. And then they were asked, what would it look like if you would apply that um, drawing, for example, to this question that uh, you just formulated? How would that look like? And just use, you know, just, uh, pretend as if it would be that as if it would be uh, it uh, it pro would provide serious information for you and mm. although this is just a game right it's an experiment it's a game it's a playful way to work with um, idea generating processes to uh, around a certain subject matter and so again this is all in very short time frame uh, ideas came up how how this could be applied to um to the physics topic for example he said that you know it could show a visible it shows a visible cauldron and then so it could maybe explain the phenomena of light by an invisible source in the same way that the dark matter influences our universe without yet being seen directly hmm. um and and so although this would probably just be a, a playful random brainstorming kind of uh, output it basically um, proved that there's some form of inspiration trespassing the boundaries of the disciplines um, which means that for art can be inspirational for physicists too in their idea generating process and that was what this experiment was about okay yeah, and it's, you know, sounds like pretty big, it's interesting how one artwork can um, stimulate a pretty big question, like where <laughs> dark matter appears to be a new form of matter, 
where does it take us in broadening our understanding of the laws of physics at the most fundamental level? Like, <laughs> okay, so I have to. Yeah, it makes me want to stay an artist, personally. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I have to make a, uh, a probably the, I have to make it clear that in the first, the first step was about an unfiltered response and association process that comes out of the artwork. And then the second setting an intention meant to actually set aside the artwork, go back into the their own field of physics and formulate uh, a pressing question in physics research in regard to dark matter. And okay. that is what that means. So, so he's, this is a formulation of what he thinks is a pressing question. Dark matter appears to be a new form of matter. But where does it take us in broadening our understanding of the laws of physics at the most fundamental level? And so then I ask them, that is separate from the first step, right? And then mm -hmm. in the third step, I ask them, so what would it look like if you applied, you know, the drawing to this question? And then, and then he would make that leap, so to speak, to think, okay, maybe... If I take this seriously, it would probably show that an invisible source um, influences dark matter in the same way, like our universe, without being seen directly. Mm -hmm. so you see what that does? It's it's about idea generating processes, yeah. and and those time constraints play a a, a big role because. If you have like just one minute to think of something, to come up with some, something. Um, that circumvents your your let's say uh, um, behavior or you know everything you think you know and your rational thinking it uh, provides maybe that something can come up that is surprising something you haven't thought of before right so yeah. so it circumvents some habits that we have and and that's why um, we are doing this in these kind of short time frames. Right. So you kind of answered question two, which was, have you found that this strategy helps to make the way we see or interact with the world around us? And you're saying it does. It says it sort of disrupts our very sort of limited um, parameters of our labs or of our studios um, and yeah. um, challenges us to think um, across different disciplines for inspiration and insight. So yeah, that's really great. Yeah, and um, you know, in an aesthetic transformation process, uh, there's a dialogue that takes place um, through the passing on of images, often text too, but um, images or sounds, um, which requires uh, to listening what the predecessor has to say, right? So it's a passing on and transforming of ideas, if you like, in form of, mm -hmm. can have different forms. It can be a video, it can also be just a, an image, it can be a sound and so on. So, but any topic can be fed into a transformation process. You know, right. this is an example of a physics topic that was fed into a, a short process. Um, but um, I also, you know, pursued a project with my colleague, Margit Schild, who I'm researching this methodology um, together. Uh, we worked with inhabitants of a, of a village, of a rural area, actually, in Germany. Uh, and the topic was, what do, you, what do you think where you, where home is? And what do you understand of the term home? What is your understanding of the term home? And so we started off with a video. So, so people would take uh, two minute video sequences of their understanding of home. And it kind of passed, this was passed on to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. And it passed from German, you know, long-term residents of a village of farmers, a woman, for example, passing on to a, to a, um, a refugee from who just recently arrived from Africa, uh, or it would go to a younger person, to an older person, and so on and so on. Um, and they would respond to the predecessor's answer. And that means uh, they would transform the original concept of home from the predecessor into their own and pass that on. So it's a give and take. And in that way, it's a, it's a collective undertaking. 
Um, and so what it mm. means is that a multitude... Is it ever comparative? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean by comparative? Like I want, like a... Well, it, it kind of, well, it kind of, I see how it already is comparative in some way, but I'm just wondering, is it maybe everybody receives the first image or prompt and they compare their responses and then those, in hearing other people's responses, their second transformation, yes, be, you said, begins to reflect what they've heard. So they're getting sort of a more holistic understanding of what home can be or what home isn't like so is, is there sort of some level of um comparison or sharing that yeah mm. i think you said there yeah is. it depends on how you set up the transformation process so there is mm. a so-called process design and it can look like that in that uh example that i was have given uh it was like a kind of a linear process where it starts off with a certain concept and that is kind of transformed through, but actually the process is the most important uh, factor here because it, the process uh, renders a multitude of viewpoints and perspective, perspectives visible and also sets them in relation to each other. So, so it's opening up a space of relationality. And that's mm -hmm. what I find is important here. It's not about an outcome altogether at the end, but that that certain concepts can be seen from different angles right and that it's important right. to to also understand that my own perspective is not the absolute only perspective on the world yeah. but there are many others and in that respect i think it's um it helps to deconstruct or also undo certain preconceived notions because if you yeah. share that, if you give away your own concepts too for others to transform, you know, that's a form of relationship building, if you like, mm -hmm. and in a dialogue um, and in a kind of open ended uh, discourse. Yeah, I was going to say it so, uh, where on uh, this, it's a type of unmaking that is an opening up of. You know, we're opening up one's minds and hearts to other ways of knowing, being, perceiving, thinking. Um, yeah, that's okay. that's really interesting. And in that way, it's a collective form of, um, let's say, production of meaning. Yes. So it's not only my own, but it's kind of embedded in these many other uh, perspectives um, yeah. of meaning making in, in, with regard to a certain topic. Yeah, so it's in, you can use you can use this process to transform aesthetics, but you can also well, if we think of human um, ontology as an art form in itself, we can also use it to transform human humans' ways of seeing and being. So it, it depends on how you use the tool. Yes, yes, exactly. But also that there is some form of meaning generated collectively, right? Mm -hmm. So. If you if you watch the process later in an exhibition as an audience, you're you kind of move through all these different perspectives, but through that meaning is created, yeah, in a in a in a in a collective way, in a multifaceted way. Let's put mm -hmm. it like that. Yeah. And talking about unmaking, I think what is important here is, you know, if this is a process where artists, for example, are participating in uh, it also questions a, a, a production paradigm of art making that we have been traditionally used which is there is this genius artist the artist genius you know who creates this incredible work with new ideas whatever um, so so that basically challenges the process challenges this idea saying that no um genius is probably a collective um mm. matter where we where inspiration is is also fed through a back and forth through a dialogue and through a collective process um to come up with something new you know if yeah if you yeah and so I like that in that sense that it's less hierarchical because 
usually people are on eye level with each other, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if someone is a Nobel Prize winner, works with a student, maybe that's possible. Uh, all have the same say in how they view the world or how they view the topic, how they respond to a topic. And, and that is some form of unmaking for me. Mm. I think that's a good um, statement to sort of lead into the next question. So as a result of doing this sort of work, is there something that you've had to make about yourself um, through your research or interacting with others as a result of sort of uh, taking up or um, facilitating process of aesthetic mm -hmm. tra transformation? Oh, yes, of course, because you, um, you immerse yourself into a process where you don't have control. <laughs> um, so things are happening and you just, it's a process, right? So you, you cannot control the outcome. That's one thing. But the other uh, interesting, for me, important um, element that, uh, that ha happened was that it actually changes the, the, um, our my conception of of artistic uh, activity so so the way how i was trained and educated as an artist was all kind of geared towards this genius hmm. individual you know that almost have has like uh, has this talent and this genius coming from somewhere i don't know um and is this highly creative person uh, and it's an individual. It's the individual star artist that, right? That that's kind of also a production paradigm that means that creativity is something individual. And I came to understand that creativity is a collective process. Uh, it's a collective process anyway, because even the famous artist has been inspired by something that was already out there. Mm -hmm. So an aesthetic transformation process formalizes actually something that happens in his art history anyway, mm -hmm. uh, which is you take inspiration from others, other artists, anything that, you know, is already out there and you make this visible in a, in a kind of a, in a quick uh, exchange, so to speak, something that happens maybe over decades or something mm -hmm. happens in a quick um, exchange of works and so it's it's a quite a paradigm shift in art making and art production that basically says that the artist provides material for others. Mm. Yeah, it's, this is interesting. Kind of aligns. I I, I sort of uh, uh, got on a bandwagon a couple of years ago, saying there's nothing there's nothing there's no such thing as a self taught artist. Right. We're always learning from something and somewhere, even if it's we're just observing a twig. <laughs> um, you know, ultimately, we are learning collectively. Uh, and and so I like that your idea is sort of reiterating this, that we're, we've, we've all learned from someone or in somewhere. Um, and this idea that we ha we're geniuses alone and we've arrived at our skill alone is, is a huge myth. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so in, you have a really interesting article out called Communicating with Place and Plants Through Sensory Drawing. And I look forward yes. to you sharing some of your drawings. And you speak of, a, of sensing versus looking. And, and, and you've been facilitating workshops so that observers or witnesses become embedded in the world in, instead of dominating it. Um, and this is also sort of speaking to this letting go of control. And so I wonder if you could clarify the difference between simply looking and mimicking what we see and visualizing what we sense. How do you how do you help to differentiate these two things for people? Yeah, okay. Let me show you some images here too. Mm. So this is uh, an example of uh, what I call sensory drawing. Mm. So now we're shifting to, it's, it's also a form of relational art making because, um, and a conceptual art of drawing, 
um, because if you sit down and you you are at a certain place and you you draw what you see with eyes open, which is usually about representation, right? Representation of what the material world looks like. Um, what I'm what I'm what I'm doing is um, I'm also I'm actually closing my eyes. I go to a place, or I go and or I sit across from a tree, for example, or a plant, and I. Um, it's almost like coming out of a meditation practice, which means you you are mm, making your mind blank and let anything appear that uh, wants to appear uh, in front of your eye, um, mind's eye. Mm. And um, the as an art practice, it basically also renders. Um, the assumption that the world around us is alive and that is even possible to to some sort of communicate with place uh, and receive some form of if you want you can call it information or yeah I, well the the experience that I have when I make this drawing is that I, it's almost like diving into history it's almost like um, that I receive some form of images that has to do with a place that have to do with the plants and it sounds like almost like metaphysical but it's just an observation that I do so it's just an observational um, process so here I basically created a map uh, at this very old ancient place in uh, Germany um, where I had, where I went to certain places and then just draw what I saw, but I was with eyes closed. So those are just those sketchy, these are sketchy um, images because I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to briefly sketch down what I see, right? Maybe I show you another one. Um, well, can I just comment that? Yes. That, I, I, are you drawing what you see or are you drawing what you're sensing? Because all of those look like extremely empty landscapes, the pictures, the photos, but the drawings all look very figurative and alive. And mm -hmm. so it's almost like, I, were you sensing bodies that are occupying those spaces versus drawing just the spaces? Yeah, I, um, I agree. Uh, um, it's about sensing, but interestingly, I'm a person who's very visual. So even if I have my eyes closed, it's like I can see movies. <laughs> it's almost like dreaming, right? Um, uh, so I don't know. What do you see right now? In the yeah, we see. I see sketches in a sketchbook, a range sketchbook. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I personally, I see a lot of things, and some things are, you know, quite blurry or it's not. But then some figuration occurs and then it kind of fades away and that's what I try to draw mm. and this is my 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 personal way of how you know what happens and I guess I have to say it's a cognitive process that I'm trying to um oh I can leave this here no I need this uh that I'm trying to record um so I'm tracing mental imagery more or less I know that other people rather, you know, have different, they see colors or whatever, and I see forms and mm. that's what I'm, so it's just for me a, a kind of a, a process of seeing um, and, and um, it, I can basically induce it with a certain technique that I've learned through meditation and trance technique. Um, and then while I sit across a plant or at a distinct site. So my my visual sense is blocked, but my sensory channels channels are opened for intensified perception. Yes, and and the mark making basically evolves from from this kind of percept percept intensif intensified perception. Um, and and would you would you argue that it's important that we just stop looking and start sensing instead, like? What do you feel is generated by sensing versus just mimicking or looking or 
what are we yeah yeah um i guess what this also expresses is that um it suggests a certain worldview right it suggests that the world around us is not dead i mean mm -hmm. <laughs> still some people probably think that and and but it's alive and that i'm basically tapping into something uh, that is out there and it basically completely shifts my relationship to the world because um it means that i'm part of something but there's also some something uh, that a tree for example might have history uh, a plant might even be able to communicate in some sense uh, because and I can just claim it you know I, we don't know but that would mean that um, a plant is a living being and not just something dead also a, a lake or a river or a mountain or a site has some sort of history and um, even some life and that is a paradigm shift in terms of uh, if you go, you know, if you want to see it philosophically, um, that the human centeredness is called into question. And I think this is the whole discussion, uh, discussion about the Anthropocene is that, uh, you know, human impact on Earth is considered uh, as um, destructive and uh, coming also out of a philosophical Western tradition where man is put on the at the top of creation and it's basically everything is there for us and our interests are the main interests. Mm -hmm. And um, if you if you go into a relation to the world around you through a, through sensors through sensing, right? And this is just one form of it. Some people you know also do it through music or through through the through audio and um, you're suggesting that uh this concept does not work anymore right we are not we are not the, it's not all about us right it's not mm -hmm. about uh, humans alone yeah. it's about the other than humans as well um and that they have something to say even if you are there to listen yeah, sound would do that very well. And I'm sure Matt's happy to hear that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely fascinated by this um, sort of approach. Um, and I love how sort of abstract it, com abstract it becomes in that, um, you know, it doesn't, it almost allows for um, access by multiple viewers or audiences or but also even sort of um, present because of this sort of layering uh, sense of your mark making almost presents multiple viewpoints at the same time as well or multiple bodies coming forward so that's that's fascinating but I'm just wondering do you have exercises that help people and make themselves from these our sort of traditional approaches to fine art drawing like how how do you get people to let go uh um of those sort of preconceptions of what drawing is supposed to be in order to re reach these deeper states of consciousness with their surroundings yeah i think it's a it's it's a process of mindfulness so mindfulness training and that's that's a, a buddhist tradition so bringing one's attention to the present moment um, and experience the present moment without evaluation, without judgment. Um, it's basically about to be fully present, whatever that means, and to be aware and 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 not and actually let go of any kind of preconceptions and and then see what's coming in, what happens. For me, it, it was a process to learn that. And as I said, um, some year long practice in transcendent, transcendental meditation. Uh, and trans uh, trans work uh, with Nana Nauwelt, which is uh, a fascinating way to shift consciousness at will, which means each one of us can do that. It's just what our mind is capable of doing and maybe even does it all the time. For example, if you space out, if you're tired, sometimes you remember, you space out and then you're like, 
sitting there and your mind wanders off, that's already uh, this shift of consciousness that we are talking about. And meditation and trance is uh, just works with this more consciously. And, and this is something that can be trained. And um, it's, a, it's a basically a, a brain. Um, the brain is in a state of fully being fully awake, uh, but um, so uh, there are there are dream stages where you are where you're dreaming a lot, and so the brain waves have a certain length, and you can actually with when when you're still full full awake you're full awake you can actually enter this kind of brain state, uh, uh, this, which is almost like a dream state, and this dreaming is something that we can train and uh, yeah be fully aware and it also has to do with perception so you 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 have to let go but then you also make yourself open for whatever you perceive and mm. being in nature is a very good place to to do that to train that um and so and then being in silence and and listening so, so so all yeah. these that are where no traffic is, you know, that's why probably people also ah, like to go into nature. Mm -hmm. I think what's, you know, one of the important, the other important things I see about these type of drawings where we're sensing our environment versus um, depicting it in a, in sort of these, um, the, the, our understanding or tropisms of what a landscape painting or drawing has been, um, you know, has come to mean within sort of Canada's national identity, like a group of seven, or um, is that it works to escape the terra nullius um, concept, right? Where there are very much bodies present within your drawings, <laughs> what, regardless of whether we can identify them, they are very much alive and vibrating. Um, and so, and then as well as you're not trying to depict a landscape for everyone, you're just, your individual mark making or uniqueness of your mark making ultimately simply represents your experience or sensing of that landscape versus trying to depict a landscape for everyone else. So it really, um, you know, works to escape a lot of those problematic issues with um, our traditional understanding of landscape painting or drawing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah, right. So the landscape probably, I would say, would then... So if, I, for example, here, this was a project in Berlin uh, where I then, in the exhibition, I, I, I was sitting at a certain place every day and draw and certain things would come up. And I personally, from having it done now for a, a lot of times and at different places, it really seems that there is some history in places that can be perceived. I don't know. Anyway, and I, I, I present them at the space where I drew them. And, and then these little stories even occur, right? But I guess I, I'm also just, like I said, I'm just an observer and I'm just presenting what I have observed and what I have recorded without being able to interpret what it actually means. Mm. What I yeah. found interesting in this other drawing here um, is that I wasn't, that, that was when I took a trip in the Yukon and I just drew some plants and this, in here I, I kind of drew that this plant can be put on wounds and it turns out that um, when I looked up the plant afterwards, uh, that that's actually really true. You can use that as a as a. Hmm. You have a if you have, if you have a wound, you can use that for uh, and it helps you healing. And I thought that was interesting. And it, you know you can always say, oh, this is your preconception, whatever. But I'm uh, I'm usually I don't do that. And um, so sometimes also when I do this with I also draw people that way portraits oh, I show you you want to see a portrait of a person sure um let's see oh now I put this 
Oh damn! I put it away. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I'm, uh, I think I, I didn't include that, but I can show this one here. Mm, and and that's another another setting where I was uh, basically working with uh, with an orchestra, the Vancouver. Um, Oh, cool. Music ensemble. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would actually make sensory drawings and they would translate it into sound. And wow. I would basically draw, I would, I would kind of tune into the place mm -hmm. <laughs> and they would tune it into whatever they perceived, right? Is it the gesture? Is it the mark making? Is it the form? And so that is another interesting setting where I, you know, where mm -hmm. this sensory drawing came into um, creative process with others. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Um, again, right, expanding that transdisciplinary notion where now you're working with musicians as well and the performance. Um, so, uh, you know, there I, me be, me included in this, I used to be, you know, painting landscapes and ultimately looking for commercial outlets to sell them. And, um, uh, you know, so really very much part of sort of this circuit of commercial art practice and recognizing, you know, the numerous problems that are part of that market. Um, and just wondering, Yes. I guess we're, you know, we've talked briefly about this in terms of um, you're not creating work for a market, uh, like a commercial market per se. And just, I wonder if you can express why for you it's important um, to not necessarily consider um, art as for, as a commodity. Um, like what, how, why do you see working in this way is important to sort of counteract what's going on? in that other sphere yeah um i think it took me a while as a young artist you you're trained you know when you're going through education and training everything is kind of geared towards art market and success is always if you get a show there and and, and a show there and and to understand that um Art making for me has become a way to uh, of, of a tool of critique, a critique of my own culture, and a way to express how I receive the world um, in a way that maybe other people can then, when they look at the artwork, then that they can connect to. But it's also an expression of my relationality to to the world, uh, especially th through the drawings. Um, but I've, you know, whatever I encounter is something that if I express it through an artwork, it, um, it renders a certain relationship to, to, to how I am in the world. And that is important to me. And that is independent of commodification or not. And actually it has turned out that I, way more interested in in community building or in, in yeah even in those participatory processes where people go into a dialogue that something happens some change happens that i think is maybe beneficial to us or to the world then you know um the, the art market is very much um determined by also by wealth and wealthy people and and it's not that there's that's great art so i totally can enjoy that but it's not what i think the world necessarily needs if everything is commodified right mm. it's also at a certain point it doesn't make sense anymore why is one painting two millions and the other painting is worth nothing or whatever or yeah. if, depending if what gender you are it's two millions more so there's a lot of perks with that and not that i not i am enjoying all sorts of art uh, but being part of that commodifying process is actually the opposite of what i want i think 
if I would, if I, you know, if I, if you ask me, I think we should rather get out of this commodification of everything. Mm. Our economy is so geared towards profit, towards, yeah, that everything is yeah. into a commodity. And I would rather think we should get away from that. And the gestures that I try to bring into the world and through the art is, is rather about something that talks about other things. It talks about mm -hmm. relationship. Well, it's interesting, right? Because the commercial you're talking about what you needed was community and collaboration, and ultimately that sort of commercial art market is very isolating in it just due to the competition, right? Or always um, having to best everyone else or outshow everyone else, and so it can be a very um, isolating sphere of activity. Um, and the sort of 15 minutes of fame can disappear very quickly. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's interesting that it, it ultimately ties into what you're saying about, I need this from my practice. I need to connect with others and um, be some, be part of something that where um, multiple people or minds and ideas are involved. Um, so, I, and I really liked, you know, how you mentioned that ultimately as young artists, we grow up through an educational system that sort of um, purports this, right? Like it's, you know, make objects, sell them, get real, you know, become an excellent painter, an excellent drawer. And what does that mean? <laughs> um, all for this idea of selling and we're becoming this famous genius and whatever international art market person. And so... Um, I'm wondering, like, what else needs to be unmade sort of about the world or the art world um, specifically if we are going to encourage artists to work in a more relational way with the earth um, and, you know, ultimately examine how our practices can be decommodified um, to build community, build understanding, um, create meaning. Um, you know, what, what do we help? What else has to be unmade, Elvira, if we, we want young artists to not have to take as long as we took <laughs> to get to these different uh, realizations? There is a, a great book by Clark Mackey. It's called Vernacular Culture. And the more I kind of grew... When I collect culture? Vernacular culture. Vernacular oh, vernacular culture. culture. Okay. And it's yeah, about yeah. processions, you know, like everything that happens in a community, music making, dancing, and then also processions and puppet making and uh, all these practices that that come from the, the rather grassroots practices and not high art, right? Like all the art activities that come out of a com communal pool, so to speak. I found this very interesting and stimulating that... Uh, that art um, comes back to have a function for the community. But honestly, I think art should be as free as it, you know, art is free. And so anything should be, should happen. I cannot, what, how can I say that? I, I don't think, um, well, if we want to unmake the commodification of art, then we should think about capitalism. And then we should think about alternatives to capitalism that would eventually also affect art, I think, I think and art making. But how, how the art making should happen, I think, that's, I think that should be completely free and, and that's the exciting part of it. But thinking of alternatives of capitalism for me is, for example, thinking about how could we set up local economies, um, direct democracy, um, uh, and and provide a democratic space that that also allows for multiplicity of of of, of opinions and a, 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 a wide discourse so that um, that everyone's voice is heard even if we don't like it but we can talk about it that's democracy right and um, and that we are also. Uh, provided with a diverse landscape of, of news, for example, and information gathering, so that making our, up our opinions is not so much directed from certain interests from above. I say, I say above, which means um, 
because I think that uh, nowadays, even my mainstream media, even media that we think are balanced, uh, are very much hand in the hand of monopolies and uh, and also wealth. And so, so you're never sure what what information you actually get. And and um, I also receive a lot of. I think there's a lot of censorship going on, and it's called fake. Uh, mm. fact checking it's called fact checking today because fact checking is not checking uh hardly ever checking the the claims that authorities do make or governments but it's always kind of directed towards the the base is like the everyone who says something and it's totally wrong whatever so fact checking is i think a very interesting also topic to talk about but coming back to the <laughs> unmaking uh, would be to, so the economy has so centralized that we actually live now in a times of mono, of absolute monopoly of certain investment companies. Um, and I has just learned this recently that even the, um, if you have the oil industry or the pharmaceutical industry or the food industry, uh, those are not separate Mm, uh, companies anymore they have different names but they're actually all owned by uh, a few uh, investment companies so we have a de facto monopoly and this is uh, um, not visible to the mm. public so I think we are in a in a kind of a power situ relationships that that are not very helpful in terms of you know, getting out of the mess of the Anthropocene, which is the destruction of the world, uh, mm -hmm. which I also blame capitalism for quite a bit, mm -hmm. profit orientation that basically justifies any any kind of destruction of the environment for profit reasons, for money making. And I think to kind of think differently, think about other ways of, especially in other economy, um, that would also mean that would also influence art making. Maybe it wouldn't, but it would not make it a commodity, right? Because mm -hmm. it's yeah. I I, I thought I actually heard that. Um, am I right in saying that Germany, if you are a professional artist with a degree, you actually have a um, an annual income? No, no. But what you have is. Um, uh, you get a support in insurance, <clears throat> so you you're like uh, self-employed, mm -hmm. and this is usually very high insurance uh, fees, right? Like here as well. Mm -hmm. But um, the 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 government and also all the museums and uh, art institutions, they um, they they fund half of of that um, insurance for for artists. Okay. Through through the everyday, um, I don't know. It's kind of a tax that everyone pays, and so that's a uh, support for artists if you okay. are insured. It's such a it's very let's say affordable, so to speak, and very important because you have the same health insurance and uh, retirement fund, and so okay. On. So like a, a subsidy. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. But not, but you're not not necessarily funded then. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay. So you mentioned one book, the vernacular culture, I guess we'll I'd just end. Um, if there are any other like books or essays or podcasts oh, yes. you would uh, recommend. Yeah. In terms of yeah. this, I know you're extremely into <laughs> looking at alternatives for capitalism. So would love to know what you're reading. Um, um, well, Clark yeah. Mackey is in the, I just type it. Clark um, Mackey. Okay. Hello. Culture. Um, but then what I love to listen to is um, For the Wild podcast with Ayana Young. I'm sorry, what was it called? For the Wild. For the Wild, yep. Podcast. Uh, in the chat. Um, so it's, it's actually, it's called an anth anthology of the Anthropocene. Um, and it focuses on land-based protection, co-liberation, intersectional storytelling, 
uh, rooted in a paradigm shift away from human supremacy, endless growth and consumerism. And mm. she is interviewing yeah, leaders of grassroots leaders, you know, that all think about the different ways how uh, out of the Anthropocene, so to speak. Mm. I think it's just fabulous. Thank I you. did watch recently um, Koya Naskatsi again. Do you remember this video, this film, Koya Naskatsi? No, I don't think so. What? I got Fred, got Frey Reggio from okay. 1982. 1982, this is 40 years ago. This is an experimental film where where he juxtaposes human activities, cities, and so on with something that actually later also turned up in um, Edward Bertinsky's and Jennifer Bikewell's and Nicolas de Pensier's work on the Anthropocene, right? They, they created this amazing videos, Edward Bertinsky as a photograph by Jennifer Bikewell. Also, mm -hmm. this amazing film, the Anthropocene, that almost beautifies <laughs> Yeah, like mining projects and uh, Koya Naskatsi did this 40 years ago it's quite amazing I was quite touched to see that so you know thinking in mm -hmm. the future too what 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 capitalism actually how destructive it is yeah well this has been a, an amazing discussion um I I I'd like to open up the discussion or any questions from those who um, were devoted enough to stay on and, and listen, despite me disappearing for a while. Um, but before we do that, I'd just uh, like to thank you, Elvira, for taking your time and energy to be with us at the Young Making Network this evening, as well as thank again my sponsors, uh, Queen's University, uh, Social Sciences Community Research Council, and the McLaren Art Center for sponsoring um, this interview.